Hello everyone, Professor Sexton here with a short video lecture on Kate Chopin's The Story of an Hour. Um, this is the first short story that we're reading and discussing in class this semester. Uh, and it's a short story. I mean, it, it is short. It is three pages. Um, so uh, it's a quick read. And it's also a very good introduction to short stories. I'm not going to bring the story up. Um, so I'll, it'll just be you looking at me. But what I'm going to do uh, is, I'm not even going to give you a basic plot summary of the um, short story. I'm just going to kind of like go through and point out some of the literary terminology um, that was discussed in a previous video lecture. So the story of an hour, uh, it's a story by Kate Chopin, published in 1894. And the only reason I mentioned the publication date is that gives you some sense of time, place, and setting. So keep in mind when we were talking about setting. So we're looking at the 1890s. Now, even though the story itself doesn't tell you um, what country it's set in, it's in the United States. And the only reason I know that it, Kate Chopin is a U.S. writer, that doesn't mean that just because someone's a U.S. writer, they have to write a story set in the U.S. But I know a little bit background information about the story. Uh, so not only is it set in the 1890s, the whole story happens in a house. So there's no movement outside of the house. And it happens actually in an hour uh, is the whole point of the story. The main character of the story is a woman named Louise Mallard. And so she will be our protagonist um, because she is the main character of the story. Um, for most readers, she is the one with whom we feel sympathetic. Um, there may be other readers who do not feel sympathetic with her, which is totally fine. Um, but she, for most people, she is the protagonist because she is the main character. The point of view of the story is told from her point of view. Now, this is a third person narrator. So it's not uh, Louise Mallard who tells the story. It's a third person narrator. And this third person narrator is a limited narrator in the sense that this narrator has access to the information that occurs to, to uh, Louise Mallard's thoughts but not necessarily the thoughts of other characters uh, in the story. And the story is told mostly through her perspective, through that of Louise Mallard. Um, what happens in the story, Louise Mallard, uh, and uh, let me just read the first part of the story, because the first part of the story is foreshadowing. So the first sentence of the story reads, knowing that Miss Mallard was afflicted with a heart trouble, great care was taken to break to her as gently as possible the news of her husband's death. So this is foreshadowing because this whole issue of her having a heart trouble comes back to play later on in the story. So that first sentence already tells us what's going to happen in the story. So this lady learns that her husband has died. And what the narrator points out is that when she hears the story of her husband's death, she doesn't respond to it the way that most people will respond to it. Uh, and this is the third paragraph where the narrator states, she did not hear the story as many women have heard the same with a paralyzed inability to accept its significance. She wept at once with sudden wild abandonment in her sister's arms. When the storm of grief has spent itself, she went away to her room alone. She would have no one follow her. And the thing that I always pay attention to in the literary work is when authors give us details. Because I think that a good author doesn't put anything in a literary work that is not necessary, that she or he doesn't want us to read, or that has some significance to the overall theme of the work. So keep that in mind. When Miss Mallard goes away to her room, you get another scene, another setting of this story. And so even though I say like the story is set in 1890s and that it's set in the house, Another more important setting is Louise Mallard's room, because a lot of what happens in the story happens in that room. So when she goes to that room, the narrator describes this. The narrator says, there stood facing the open window, a comfortable roomy armchair. 
And to this she sank, pressed down by physical exhaustion that haunted her body and seemed to reach into her soul. Continues, she could see in the open square before her house the tops of trees that were all a quiver with new spring life. The delicious breath of rain was in the air. In the street below, a peddler was crying his wares. The notes of a distant song which someone was singing reached her faintly, and countless sparrows were twittering in the eaves. Continues, there were patches of blue sky showing here and there through the clouds that had met and piled one above the other in the west facing her window. So it's very interesting that when she's in this room, look at what the narrator describes her as taking notice of. The open window, comfortable rooming chair, the open square, the trees all afresh with a new life, the patches of blue sky. All of those elements are things that gives us this tone of happiness, joy, you know, spring, openness, blue sky. These are all good things. But then contrast that to the news that she had just heard that her husband had died. And so the narrator is setting you up for something here. Um, we get further description of Miss Mallard, um, you know, her physical characters, characterizations, things of something of that nature. And then we start to see what is really going on in the story. And this happens on the second page, uh, third paragraph, when the narrator uh, reports, when she abandoned herself, a little whispered word escaped her slightly parted lips. She said it over and over under her breath, free, free, free. The vacant stare and the look of terror that had followed it went from her eyes. They stayed keen and bright, her pulses beat fast, and the coursing blood warmed and relaxed every inch of her body. She did not stop to ask if it were or were not a monstrous joy that held her. A clear and exhausted, exhausted perception enabled her to dismiss the suggestion as trivial. So she's just learned that her husband had died. And she wept. We saw that. We saw that in the first page. As soon as she heard the news, she wept instantly. She went to her room. But then look outside the room. Look at the open square. Look at the open window. See, hear the birds singing. Hear the spring life. And then... When this feeling that she's been trying to suppress comes up to her, free, 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 three times this is said, what becomes clear is that in a way, Miss Mallard is glad that her husband has died. What we don't know is we don't know the true nature of their relationship. The story doesn't go into a lot of details about that. But it does show that Miss Mallard has a number of conflicting emotions concerning the death of her husband. Um, it reads, she knew that she would reap again when she saw the kind, tender hands folded in death the face that had never looked safe with love upon her. And let me just say something about the use of the word save here, um, S-A-V-E. In this time period, save is used to mean accept, um, fix, gray, and dead. But she saw beyond the bitter moments a long procession of years to come that would belong to her absolutely. And she opened and spread her arms out to them in welcome. Um, and then there's this sense that there will be no one to live for in the coming years. So all of a sudden, Miss Mallard realizes she has this sense of freedom. And what becomes kind of clear in the story is that she never really loved her husband. And what we don't know is we don't know the reason why they were married, because the narrator tells us in a paragraph at the very bottom of page two, it reads, and yet she had loved him. And then there's a dash. Sometimes, period, often she had not. And so it brings up a lot of issues that the story doesn't indicate. But looking at the time period, 1890s, perhaps this was not a marriage for love. Perhaps this was an economic marriage um, because it doesn't seem that she, it doesn't seem that she loved him. However, I think he loved her. So it seems like a one-sided relationship. And one of the things that might be a hint 
to the nature of their relationship. There's a moment in the narr- in the in the story where the narrator says, and this is one paragraph, there will be no powerful will bending hers in that blind persistence with which men and women believe they have a right to impose a private will upon a fellow creature. A kind intention or a cruel attention made the act seem no less a crime as she looked upon it in the brief moment of illumination. And the way that I've always read this is, it seems to me, and keep in mind I'm saying seems to me, it seems to me that the relationship between Louise Mallard and her and her husband was one-sided in the sense that whatever she wanted to do got subordinated to whatever he wanted to do. So it was kind of the sense that if he suggested something, that is what they would do. Now, it doesn't seem as if he would say no to what she wanted to say, but it seems as if she just never felt like she had the voice to say that. In a lot of ways, you can kind of think of this story in parallel to My Last Duchess, because this is almost a relationship that the Duke wanted, right? Where the Duke wanted someone who was going to be submissive to him and do exactly what he wanted that wife to do. Whereas in this story, this wife does that, but you can kind of see that physical repression that it builds up on her and it, and it, and it shows in her body and perhaps the heart trouble that she experiences is a cause of that. Um, and so she comes to realize that her husband's death is actually a great thing or a good thing for her. And the narrator tells us that she keeps whispering free body and soul free. Um, and so she's thinking of all the future years that she'll have to herself to do as she want. And her sister Louise knocks on the, her sister Josephine knocks on the door, uh, says, Louise, let me in, because Josephine is of the assumption that Louise is up there making herself sick with grief, which is not the case at all, because we as readers, we know that that is not what Louise Mallard is experiencing. And Louise says to Josephine, go away. I am not making myself ill. And then the narrator reads, no, she was drinking in a very elixir of life through that open window. Let me just clarify the definition of elixir. Elixir is normally a word used to refer to like a drug or or something of that nature. But in this story, that is not an actual drug. She's using that as the case show pan is using that as a figure, figure of speech. So it's not like Miss Mallard is on the actual drug in that story. Um, but the third paragraph, I'm sorry, the third page, it just tells us how Mrs. Mallard is looking forward to the rest of her life. Um, you know, spring days and summer days and all sorts of days that would be her own. Pay attention to that her own. So it's not as if she has to uh, suppress or, you know, do what someone else does. She can do as she likes. Um, And so she rose at length, she opens the door, she, you know, she carries herself like a a goddess of victory. But then I'm going to read the last part of the story. Someone was opening the front door with a latch key. It was Brentley Mallard who entered a little treble stain, composedly carrying his grip sack and umbrella. He had been far from the scene of the accident and did not even know there had been one. He stood amazed at Josephine's piercing cry, at Richard's quick motion to screen him from from the view of his wife, but Richard was too late. When the doctors came, they said that she had died of heart disease, of a joy that kills. So, this very short story begins with the protagonist, or who you know most people call the protagonist, Louise Mallard, hearing news her husband had died. And it shows the stages that she goes through in hearing that news and how when she's alone in the room, she comes to realize that she will now be free. And she imagines what the rest of her life will be like, because she's a young woman. The, the story tells us that. And you know the sense of freedom that she has um and how how bright the future will be like that open square that she saw outside of a window but then when she comes down her husband opens the door and we come to realize that he's not dead and then she drops dead 
The doctor says that she drops dead from the jaw that kills. Well, there's irony there because that is what an outside observer would think, but that is not what really happens in the story. So this is a perfect story in terms of a lot of those literary terminology because, you know, like, what is the tone of the story? Um, who's the protagonist? Who's the antagonist? Uh, you know, what type of characters they are? Setting is important. Um, from whose point of view is the story told? Are there any symbols in the story? And then most importantly, you know, what are the conflicts in this story? There could be more than one. So what is one of the conflicts that you see? And then lastly, the theme. Um, as I said before, I didn't go over the complete story in detail. Uh, it's a very short story. Uh, it's well worth you to read. Um, my suggestion to you as you read it, you might want to keep that short story terminology page near you so you can kind of go back and forth and look at it to see how um, you would define some of these things in this actual story. Um, this is the shortest story that we read, uh, that we will read. The other ones will get a little bit longer, but at the same time, go through the story the same way that I did. And keep in mind when it comes to the literary terminology, um, for a lot of times, it's, it's a matter of interpretation. So it's your interpretation, who you think is the protagonist, who you think is the antagonist, what you see as a conflict. But keep in mind, Whatever you view, you need to explain. And this is when you go back to the story and you read scenes and you quote lines that add to your support. Look at the time period. Uh, I think for most of the stories that we have, uh, I do give a publication date. Uh, if one of the stories don't have the publication date, uh, you can look that up. Or if you like, just send me an email and I will verify it for you and send it back to you. Okay, I hope everyone is doing well, and I hope you enjoy the story of an hour. Bye.